This is EM Cases EM Quick Hits Podcast. Quick, let's get on with it. EM Cases is brought to you by Shremi, the Schwartz Riesman Emergency Medicine Institute. That's a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving EM care through high quality research and education. The opinions expressed on this podcast are intended for general information and educational purposes only and should not be used to diagnose, treat, or prevent any medical condition, nor should they be used as a substitute for medical advice from a qualified practicing physician. Unless stated otherwise, the opinions expressed by the hosts or guests are made in their individual capacity, not on behalf of the Institute nor Medicine Cases. This episode is brought to you by Easy Recess, the resuscitation assistant. This amazing app has drug dosing, equipment size calculation, treatment algorithms, all in under three clicks. Rapid access to life-saving critical info in a user-friendly interface. Try the app for free with the promo code EMCases or visit easyrecess.com slash EMCases. That's easyrecess.com slash E-M-C-A-S-E-S. And now for the best of University of Toronto Emergency Medicine. It was way back in the very beginning of 2020 that Dr. Megan Landis approached me with what she thought at the time would be a very important educational offering to you, the EM Cases listeners. She told me that there was this new bug found in China that caused an unusual kind of pneumonia that seemed to be spreading and that we need to educate EM providers around the world about how to prepare for a potential pandemic. This was the first I'd heard of COVID. And I have to admit that the topic at the time didn't seem to be especially interesting or especially educational or especially worrisome. But I knew that Dr. Landis was an excellent educator and trusted her intuition, so I agreed to record a podcast at the time. And it turns out, of course, that she was exactly correct. That brings us to this podcast. This time, there's another virus we need to be aware of. But this virus, we've all heard about many, many times. The problem is, this virus is not on our radar in the ED very much, and it really should be. So to explain to us why it's so important to have HIV on our radar in EM, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, colleague, and sort of boss. She's the head of the division of EM in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto, Dr. Megan Landis. Welcome back, Dr. Landis. Thanks, Anton. All right. So first question is, and I've already alluded to this, is why should we have HIV on our radars in the ED in the first place? I mean, you know, isn't HIV a diagnosis that can be made by an ID specialist or a primary care doc in a non-emergency setting? And, you know, the treatment for HIV has evolved over the last 40 years or so to the point that most patients with HIV seem to live relatively healthy lives. So why do we need to know about HIV in the ED? Well, Anton, I can say we need to know about it because we're missing it. You know, in the ED, we encounter patients at incredibly high risk of HIV, many of them who only access care through the emergency department. So by relying on them to get to STI clinics or primary care, we are actually impeding their access to HIV testing. In Canada, we know that one in seven persons living with HIV do not know that they are positive. And so we also know that early diagnosis saves lives by starting treatment early for individuals themselves and also by getting people on treatment, we prevent the spread of HIV and further infections. We know that treatment is prevention. HIV treatment can reduce HIV transmission by up to 96%. It has led to the evidence-based slogan that undetectable, meaning a person's viral load, equals untransmissible, which is an incredibly empowering slogan for the community. So I guess, theoretically, if we can catch HIV early enough across the board, we could even theoretically eradicate HIV. I love that idea. And that's true. I think if we kind of start at that point and work backwards, it makes sense how picking it up early in the emergency department can help not only prevent the spread, you know, it's not just that individual who you're really helping, who you could save their life, but also helping stop the spread of it to other people. So you're kind of doing uh, individual care and public care at the same time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you can get somebody on HIV treatment early in their disease, it actually changes the trajectory of their disease. So they do better. And also, if you can take someone's viral load from millions to zero, you can ensure that 
any exposures that they that then happen that they're not going to be spreading the disease. So exactly. So it's individual care, but it's also really prevention at a population level. And there's great modeling out there to show that getting people onto treatment actually reduces the spread, like large population models, both in the U.S. and in South Africa. And the other thing that brings up is, especially currently in Canada, at least, it's very hard to access primary care. And so we're, we're seeing more and more and more of these individuals in the emergency department. And so really, there's often not a chance for them at all to get their HIV picked up early, except in the emergency department. So really, this is kind of on us, especially since there has been sort of a crumbling of primary care in, in Canada, at least in most parts of the world, actually. Exactly. We are essentially the social safety net and the healthcare safety net for many patients. And we see already an incredibly high number of high-risk patients for HIV. And I should just mention that Canada remains somewhat behind in terms of its access to HIV testing in the emergency department even. Across Canada, there is great variability in terms of the ability to access HIV testing in the emergency department. And many other countries are actually much farther ahead in terms of ensuring access to HIV care. Okay, so let's go into the emergency department now. We're in the eMERGE. I mean, we see tons of patients with fevers. We see patients with lymphadenopathy. We see patients with rashes. We see patients with oral lesions, all kinds of symptoms that could be from HIV. And it would be impractical and inefficient to test everyone for HIV who came in with some sort of viral illness. So the big question comes up is when should we suspect HIV? Who's at risk? Who should we actually be testing in the emergency department? You know, I wouldn't urge us all to think about testing anyone who presents with both a risk factor or a highly suspicious clinical condition related to HIV. And we can talk about what those are a little bit later. You know, in particular at our site where we've started rapid HIV testing in the emergency department, almost all of our new positives are people who've had both a risk factor and a clinical condition. But either of those things should trigger you to offer an HIV test to your patient. And finally, you know, we don't screen everybody who comes into the emergency department for the risk factors. It's just impractical to do that. But one way that we could improve access if, is if a patient asks for a test to actually test them. So you don't need to ask a lot of questions, but if a patient is actually asking you for a test, there's probably good reasons for it. And I would just urge us to also ensure that those patients get a test and that you are offering them a test. Let's break those down one by one. So there's the patient request. That's easy. It's knowing the high risk factor, risk factors, and other risk factors, and the clinical condition that takes some diving into. So first, let's talk about the risk factors. What are the risk factors for HIV that should trigger us to consider testing in the ED? I mean, you know, there's risk factors, and then there's risk factors. Right. So what are the ones that should really get our, our antenna up to go ahead and test? So in Canada, we know that people who are at highest risk are people who inject drugs, men who have sex with men, our indigenous populations, and people who are coming from endemic areas. You know, there's other risk factors that also make me think about testing for HIV, which are not in the highest risk category, but anyone presenting with an STI, because you know they've had an exposure, people who are presenting with multiple partners, and people who are recurrently presenting for PEP, which we see in the emergency department for sure. All right, so that's a bit about the risk factors to help us decide who to test. The other consideration is the clinical condition. Now, there are various clinical syndromes of HIV, right? There's the acute retroviral syndrome, the opportunistic infections, and then the AIDS-defining illness. So there's a lot of clinical possibilities here. What clinical presentation should heighten your suspicion for HIV and trigger, again, that test? So let's say someone comes in and you haven't really sorted out the risk factors. You're starting with their clinical presentation. Again, it could be acute retroviral syndrome, an opportunistic infection, or an AIDS-defining illness. So like what clinical condition? I mean, if someone just comes in with a fever and flu symptoms, does that mean it's, you know, it's the acute retroviral syndrome? We should test that patient. I guess if they come in with the flu plus a risk factor, that's when we should test. Absolutely. So I would say, you know, first, 
don't miss acute retroviral syndrome. So like you said, it presents like an influenza-like illness. So you get a headache, fever, rash, myalgia, lymphadenopathy, night sweats, sore throat. We see this every day in the emergency department. But if you see someone coming in with an influenza-like illness and a risk factor, so they, it comes up in their history that there is a risk factor in their, in their history, maybe they inject drugs, maybe they disclose their sexual history, then please think about HIV. This syndrome typically happens within the first month of seroconversion. So it is the very early phase of HIV as the body is starting to mount a response essentially to the virus and to the seroconversion. So the earlier we pick it up, the better. So ideally, we should be picking it up in this phase if we can. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking about how I would integrate this into my practice. So when someone comes with a fever, I have a whole bunch of standard questions, you know, some of which often pick up something that I wouldn't normally be looking for. Like the, the obvious one is recent travel history. So I ask every patient that comes in with a fever, unless obviously they have appendicitis or something, but pretty much everyone with a fever where you're not sure what it is, or especially respiratory, if they've been traveling recently. So this is just a good one to add to your list. You know, are they fully immunized? Have they been traveling recently? Are there sick contacts? Add. Add. I would add, essentially, is there a history of injecting drug use? And a sexual history, which is not out of keeping of what you would ask for a fever with an unexplained source. Good. Integrated into my clinical practice. Done. Okay, so that's the acute retroviral syndrome. Next are the opportunistic infections. So when would you suspect this kind of thing? So the list is really long in terms of the possible opportunistic infections that you could have. One of the things I definitely look at is the mouth. So you can see some clues of these opportunistic infections in the mouth. So things like angular chelitis, recurrent or multiple apthous ulcers, oral candida, and oral hairy leukoplakia. The other thing I think about is in this, this kind of secondary group of opportunistic infections is at the one to five to seven years of untreated HIV. And that means that the immune system has started to feel the effects of HIV. So you're going to have these opportunistic infections mounting. And the signs can be subtle sometimes. One of the things I often ask about is unexplained weight loss. So that happens as HIV disease progresses. And in the early days, they won't have any. But if somebody starts to report to you that they've had a 10% weight loss that's completely unexplained or more, or a 25% weight loss, I would start to be really worried that there's something else going on. And I think, I think clinically, most of us would be suspicious about that. A few other things can be, um, you know, tuberculosis, which every once in a while we see. But I think if somebody's coming with tuberculosis, especially if they're coming from an endemic area, the next question in my mind would be, is this also related to HIV disease? Because the two of those things go hand in hand in many countries where people may be presenting from, as well as chronic diarrhea can be something that could cause. So not a couple of days, but weeks and weeks of diarrhea. Okay, so fair enough to say if there's some unusual lesions in and around the mouth, think HIV. Mm -hmm. This is just simplifying it. Yeah. When we see people with unexplained weight loss, we often think about cancer, but just give yourself a little cognitive forcing strategy to also think about HIV. I like that. And same with chronic diarrhea, and that simplifies it. So we've covered the acute retroviral syndrome. We've covered clues to opportunistic infections, the mouth the unexplained weight loss and the chronic diarrhea. What about the AIDS-defining illness? Yeah, so these are all of the illnesses that we generally associate with AIDS or HIV. And many of us probably have a list from medical school that we think about. I think the big ones, like I said, wasting, so severe wasting, once people start to report that they've lost 25% of their weight, then I would start to think about it. Also, oral and esophageal candida. So I don't ask people whether or not it, I'd look in their mouth and I look for thrush, but I also ask them if it hurts when they swallow, because it means that the candida may actually be in their esophagus. The most classic one, and we're still seeing it today in the emergency department and, and in the patients that we have recently tested for HIV at our site, is PJP pneumonia. So that classic batwing bilateral looking pneumonia 
And then, of course, there are the unusual CNS presentations. So I worry about someone who's altered, who's presenting with a meningitis-like syndrome or encephalitis-type syndrome. Great. So far, we've touched on who to test. So it's having a risk factor plus one of those three clinical conditions. What about suspecting HIV on blood work? And in particular, what finding on a CBC should raise an eyebrow for HIV? So you can't just look at a CBC and know that someone has HIV. It's too bad that it can't be that easy. However, in case you see somebody who's already presenting with a risk factor, who's also presenting essentially with pancytopenia, so anemia, lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, I would be suspicious that there is a degree of immunosuppression and it would trigger my brain to think about HIV. All right. Pancytopenia can be a clue. All right. So once you've decided who needs testing, the next question that comes up is how to test. And you had mentioned a rapid HIV test. What are the options in terms of testing for HIV in the ED? I think the bottom line is just do whatever test you have. And the type of tests is incredibly variable across Canada. So I'd encourage you to find out what kind of test you have, what you have access to, and just do whatever you have. The tests themselves range from bedside point of care tests, so as simple as a finger prick at the bedside. Patients actually have access or can have access as well to self-testing with oral swabs. And there are some programs across the country to be able to do that. And the tests range also towards lab-based tests. So what we use is an antigen antibody test on a venous sample that our core lab runs. We call it a rapid test because it's done within a couple of hours within our facility. But probably the most rapid test of them all is by doing a bedside point of care test. Okay. So there are options. Find out at your institution what the options are and go with whatever is most practical in your setting. All right. I want to talk a little bit more about HIV testing. One of the many things about HIV that I had no clue about until you told me was that HIV tests have a pretty significant false negative rate in the early days of infection. What does the false negative rate for HIV testing mean from a practical perspective? Like how, how are you going to interpret your tests? Yeah, it's a bit of a complicated question because different kinds of tests have different false negative rates. So it depends on what kind of test you're doing at your, at your site. However, within the first days or the first month in that period of seroconversion, there are differing levels of viral load, differing levels of response by antibody, et cetera, which determine how the test can be run. I think, however, the real bottom line for this, though, is if you have a negative test and you think the exposure has been recent and you think this is an acute infection, if you have a high suspicion that this is an acute infection, then you must repeat the test at one to three months. So if you have someone who has a significant high risk factor who you are investigating for HIV and their test comes back negative, then you must give them some kind of follow-up and instructions about actually repeating that test in one to three months. We see bazillions of patients with chest pain and acute coronary syndromes and with venous thromboembolic disease. Outside of the traditional factors for ACS, there's things like cocaine use, lupus, and pregnancy that are all risk factors for ACS. What do we need to know about HIV and the risk for ACS and PE in patients who present to the ED with chest pain? So in terms of ACS, we know that even when we control for age, for risk factors, and for the use of antiretroviral therapy, there is still a 1.5 to two times increased risk of coronary artery disease or acute MI in these patients. It is because of the inflammatory state that HIV patients can exist in. And depending on the ART, the ART itself can be lipid altering. So I think it's important to think about it because it's not in your heart score and it's not necessarily something that triggers us to think that this might be a high risk patient, but it is something that we should remember. Also for venous thromboembolism, there is a two to tenfold increase risk. And that's because patients who have HIV can also have a prothrombotic state. And again, this is not in our well score. So it's not something that triggers us to think about their risk, but I think it's something that we need to keep in the back of our minds. 
All right. So add HIV to your classic risk factors for coronary disease and for thromboembolic disease. Excellent. All right. So that's a whole lot of great stuff on HIV. Thank you so much, Dr. Landis. If there was just a couple of nuggets you would like our listeners to take away when it comes to the recognition and testing of HIV, what would they be? I would encourage everyone to make sure they're thinking about HIV, especially in the clinical context of having a patient disclose a risk factor to you and having a clinical suspicion of an HIV-related disease. And I know there can be barriers to HIV testing, but I would just encourage any everyone to do whatever tests they have available to them. At the end of the day, testing your patient for HIV actually does save their life. It extends their life, and it also prevents further infections. Yeah, I can imagine a day where we all take this to heart and we all actually practice in this way all of the time and we eradicate HIV altogether. What a beautiful day. Thank you so much, Dr. Landis. In part two, we're going to be talking about PEP. Do you dread doing your clinical notes every shift? Do you feel like you can never get ahead of charting? If you're shaking your head yes, keep listening. Freed is an AI scribe that listens, transcribes, and writes medical documentation for you. Notes are written in your style and ready the moment the patient encounter is over. Just imagine leaving work at the same time as your last patient. Freed is HIPAA compliant, secure, and takes less than 30 seconds to learn. Artificial intelligence can't replace you, but it can do the administrative work that no human should be subjected to. All the magic happens in just a few clicks so that you can spend less energy on charting and more time on doing what you do best. Freed learns your style over time, just like a human scribe, and it'll never quit on you. More than 6,000 of your clinician colleagues already use Freed AI. Get back to spending your clinical time caring for patients and let Freed AI do the rest. Head over to getfreed.ai and use the code EMC50 to receive $50 off your first month with Freed. That's getfreed.ai with the code EMC50. I'd like you to try and guess what the sensitivity of STEMI criteria is for acute coronary occlusion that requires emergency angiography. So, in other words, what percentage of occlusion MIs are missed by sticking to STEMI criteria alone? To answer this, we've got Jesse McLaren diving deep into the failed paradigm of STEMI criteria and the importance of identifying occlusion MI that does not meet STEMI criteria. You're seeing a patient with chest pain or potential anginal equivalent and notice that some of the leads have subtle ST elevation. Does the patient have an acute coronary occlusion? STEMI criteria provides an easy answer. If there's ST elevation in at least two contiguous leads of at least a millimeter and greater in leads V2 and V3, and in the absence of left bottom branch block or LVH, then the ECG is STEMI positive and the patient has an acute coronary occlusion. If the ECG fails to meet STEMI criteria, then the patient does not have an acute coronary occlusion. But 30 years ago, some of the pitfalls of these criteria were identified. As a 1994 report on STEMI diagnosis in the ED summarized, quote, ECG abnormalities may be subtle or open to different interpretation, such as early repolarization or pericarditis. Only borderline or minimal ST segment elevation may be present, and the emergency physicians may be uncertain of its significance. The presence of left bottom branch block or LVH may complicate the ECG diagnosis, or the emergency physician may suspect that the ST elevation is old, but a previous ECG may be unavailable for comparison, end quote and there's no STEMI criteria met on the ECG, then it's by definition a non-STEMI. This is supposed to indicate a non-occlusive MI requiring non-urgent angiography. Most non-STEMI are non-occlusive, but at least 25% have acute coronary occlusion with higher mortality and preventable delays to reperfusion. And one of the main causes of reperfusion delays is adherence to the STEMI criteria. A new systematic review and meta-analysis and the International Journal of Cardiology found that while STEMI criteria had high specificity, it was only 44% sensitive for acute coronary occlusion. So STEMI criteria miss more than half 
of acute coronary occlusion, leading to delayed reperfusion. Fortunately, we now have evidence-based ECG interpretation to identify acute coronary occlusion and to guide us through these diagnostic dilemmas. First, if there's subtle anterior ST elevation, it could be normal early repolarization, or it could be LED occlusion. But if we look beyond the ST segments, we can identify ischemic abnormalities that would exclude a normal variant, including anterior Q waves, convex ST elevation, terminal curious distortion, which is the lack of an S or a J wave in V2 or V3, choroidal ST depression or T wave inversion, or inferior reciprocal change. We can also look for disproportionate ST elevation or hyperacute T waves relative to the preceding QRS. Second, if there's subtle inferior ST elevation, it could be early repolarization, pericarditis, or inferior occlusion MI. But if we look beyond the ST segments, we can identify ischemic abnormalities. These include inferior hyperacute T waves, reciprocal ST depression in AVL, or associated anterior ST depression from posterior MI. Third, left bottom branch block has secondary discordant ST elevation, but we can use the Smith modified Scarboza criteria to identify superimposed primary ischemic change. This includes any lead with concordant ST elevation, concordant ST depression anteriorly, or discordant ST elevation greater than 25% of the preceding S wave. Finally, if there's anterior Q waves with subtle ST elevation, it could be an old LV aneurysm or a new anterior STEMI. But if the subtle ST elevation is followed by a hyperacute T wave, greater than a third of the size of the preceding QRS complex, then this identifies an acute LED occlusion with a Q wave. Then there are those acute coronary occlusions without any ST elevation. If there's precordial ST depression, it could be nonspecific subendocardial ischemia or posterior occlusion MI. But if the ischemic ST depression is maximal in leads V1 to V4, this is highly specific for posterior occlusion MI. And let's not forget primary T wave changes, including De Winter T waves indicating occlusion and Wellens waves indicating spontaneous reperfusion at risk for reocclusion. These are only some of the evidence based ECG criteria which raised the sensitivity for acute coronary occlusion from the 40s to the 80s with preserved specificity. But that also means that patients can have acute coronary occlusion without any ECG changes. This is where other diagnostic bedside tools are crucial, including clinical features like refractory ischemia or hemodynamic or electrical instability, or POCUS findings like new regional wall motion abnormalities. All of these advances in the diagnosis of acute coronary occlusion have given rise to the proposed paradigm shift from ST elevation to occlusion MI. So when you're seeing a patient with chest pain or anginal equivalent, and there are subtle ECG changes, it's not a measurement question of whether or not the ECG meets STEMI criteria. It's a clinical question of whether or not the patient has an acute coronary occlusion. And we can use advances in ECG interpretation and POCUS to rapidly diagnose occlusion MI and advocate for our patients. Check out the past two ECG cases blogs on EM cases, one on how ECG and POCUS complement each other, and the other on the paradigm shift from STEMI to occlusion MI. So much important material in there that probably requires some more ECG studying for most of us. There's opportunity to hone your occlusion MI ECG interpretation skills at Dr. McLaren's HEARTS courses that he's offering the day before the EM Cases Summit. So if you go to emcasesummit.com and scroll down, you'll see two online courses offered on November 20th. One for North American folks and another for Australian and New Zealand time zone. While you're at it, you can check out the lineup for the summit. Tickets for the summit go on sale starting July 16th. And if you can't wait for a Hearts ECG course and want one sooner, Dr. McLaren is offering an online advanced Hearts course June 23rd to 30th. Go to heartsecgcourse.com to check out if it's sold out yet. All right, next up we have Swami who's going to talk about some recent literature on when to intubate the poisoned patient. Now, this gets us thinking about the downsides of intubation, even in the patient who's totally hemodynamically perfectly stable. GCS less than eight must intubate. Some version of this little rhyme has been taught to emergency clinicians for the last 30 plus years. <laughs> 
The vast majority of emergency practitioners right now have learned that motto. If the GCS is less than eight, we must intubate. But there's so many problems with that particular motto or that little rhyme, that little ditty. It doesn't make a ton of sense. We have learned over decades of practice that trying to simplify a complicated decision down to a single number, whether that be a GCS or an ABG, is a bad way to practice medicine. We shouldn't be making decisions to intubate based on one single parameter. Forget about the fact that the parameter itself is severely flawed. The GCS or Glasgow Coma Scale was created in the 1970s by a couple of Scottish neurosurgeons. That's where the Glasgow comes from. And this was created to try and describe the level of consciousness in brain injured patients, try to standardize that practice. What we have learned from multiple studies is that GCS isn't standard. The interrater reliability isn't very good. We've all had these circumstances where you do a GCS and you say it's 12, and then a trauma surgeon does a GCS and they say it's 13, and then a neurosurgeon does a GCS and they say it's nine. It's all over the map. And it's not just because the patient's changing, it's because the interrater reliability for this particular score is not very good. And so not only should we not rely on a single parameter to make a decision, a complicated decision like intubation, but we shouldn't rely on a single parameter that's not reliable across providers. Of course, GCS was really created in the trauma realm, but we have seen it generalized to other patients as well. One of the big categories is those patients with intoxication, whether it be from alcohol or some other drug. And because this practice or this teaching has become so ingrained in our minds, it's hard to reverse course. And so it's good to have some high quality research, which we finally do have the effect of non-invasive airway management of comatose patients with acute poisoning, a randomized control trial by Freund and colleagues in JAMA 2023. This study took patients with GCS less than nine with a presumed intoxication as the cause of that change in GCS and randomized them to a conservative strategy where intubation was kind of pushed off versus the standard routine practice. The study outcome is a little complicated here. The primary outcome was a hierarchical composite endpoint, and we're not going to get into what exactly that means. That's really for the stat heads to dive into. But one of the big important findings here to look at is the rate of intubation. In the group that had the conservative approach, we're going to stave off that intubation. The intubation rate was 18%. It was 60% in the standard practice group. That is a 42% difference, a number needed to treat of two and a half. If we instituted this more conservative practice change, our standard practice, for every three patients we see, one would not get intubated. That is a huge benefit for our patients. Of course, the thing that people worry about is that their GCS is low, they're not protecting their airway, they're going to vomit, they're going to aspirate, they're going to get an aspiration pneumonia, and that's going to cause more complications down the line. That is not what these authors found. In fact, when we looked at pneumonia rates in this group, it was 7% in the group that had the conservative management versus 14.7% in the group that had the routine care. So the group that was more likely to get intubated had a higher rate of pneumonia, not a lower rate. And in fact, they had a higher rate of all adverse outcomes. So across the board, our standard practice for comatose patients presumed to be from intoxication was worse for the patient. Higher intubation rate, higher pneumonia rate, higher adverse event rate. There's a great editorial that goes along with this article written by Zaf Kassim and Jean-Marie Perron and Kit Delgado that I think is important to read as well because it really does give context to what these findings mean. Since we're on the topic of dogmatic airway practices or dogmatic teachings that lead to decisions, I think it's important to bring up the gag reflex. I was taught by some people that I trained under that if the patient has intoxication and doesn't have a gag reflex, they should be intubated for airway protection. That was about 20 years ago. I thought that training had gone away, but I'm starting to hear it reemerge once again, which means it probably never went away at all. Intubating a patient for a lack of gag reflex is a bad practice. Stop. That's it. It is a bad practice to intubate simply because the patient doesn't have a gag reflex. First of all, there are people walking around normally who just don't have a very profound gag reflex. And so if you go and stick your fingers in the back of their throat, they're not going to gag. And you're like, wow, this person who's walking around right now, I should probably intubate them. Not really a good thought process. Now, I know that nobody is thinking that, but perhaps the patient in front of you 
never had a gag reflex to start with. And so testing a gag reflex to make that decision to intubate doesn't make a lot of sense. That, of course, doesn't even take away from the point of testing someone's gag reflex seems like a bad idea. If I have a comatose patient, whether it be from head trauma, whether it be from intoxication, and I stick something in the back of their throat, if they do have a gag reflex, they're going to throw up, increasing their chance of aspiration, increasing their chance of having a difficult airway should I decide to protect it. So testing the gag reflex in and of itself is not such a great idea. If we're not going to use that GCS less than eight number, if we're not going to use the gag reflex to make these decisions, how should we be proceeding? This is nuanced, and that is not exactly what everybody wants to hear. I think people would love to have a simple trigger to say, if this, then do this. That's just not how medicine works. These decisions are nuanced, and we have to understand that nuance. In the comatose patient in front of me, whether it be from head trauma, whether it be from intoxication or some other metabolic cause, we're going to take a full assessment of that patient and use that to guide our management of the airway. We're going to use all of the information in front of us to make that decision, which means for many patients, we're simply going to wait. We're going to look at that patient. We're going to determine what is the best course right now. How do I get my workup done? Will that be facilitated by taking over the airway? Do I think this patient has an immediate risk for decompensation, for hypoxemia, for hypercarbia, for underventilation, or for some other issue that I need to take the airway right now? And if not, then I'm going to wait and I'm going to reassess. And I'm going to serially reassess that patient to see which direction they're moving in, whether they announce to me that they need an airway or they announce to me, actually, I'm improving and I don't need that airway. But we're not going to boil down this decision to one data point, whether that be a GCS or a gag reflex. And now a word from one of our sponsors, Easy Recess, the resuscitation assistant. Did you know that Easy Recess is brought to you by a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving care and resuscitation? This means that every dollar from your subscription goes to improving Easy Recess. But not only that, thanks to your contributions, Easy Recess can be made affordable for healthcare workers in developing countries so that they can also deliver the best care possible to their patients. If you want to help them in their mission, download Easy Recess and use promo code EMCASES to get your first two months free or visit easyrecess.com slash emcases for more details. Welcome to another CGEM and EM Cases collaboration. Today I'm joined by the legend Britt Long to chat with you about the evaluation and management of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Welcome, Britt. Hey, Hans. Always great to be here with you. We're going to base this on a Just the Facts article that we recently collaborated on called The Evaluation and Management of Spontaneous and Bacterial Peritonitis. Let's get started. End-stage liver disease resulting in cirrhosis and ascites is a major cause of death worldwide and is associated with a variety of complications. One of the most common and deadly complications of end-stage liver disease with cirrhosis is spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, or what we'll be calling SBP. With that being said, let's dive right in. Britt. What is SBP? SBP is a bacterial infection of the acidic fluid, and there's no other apparent intra-abdominal focus. This is the most common infection in patients with cirrhosis. It's about 30% of all infections, and it's present in anywhere between 5 even up to 30% of cirrhotic patients who are admitted with ascites. Unfortunately, the outcomes aren't that great. The mortality rate ranges anywhere between 15 to 40 percent, and the survival rate at one year after a single episode is 40 percent. So obviously, this is an incredibly important disease that we cannot miss as emergency physicians. That being said, then, how does SBP present? And is there anything that's reliable, at least on history and physical exam? The classic presentation, the one that we learn about, is abdominal pain or tenderness, fever, and then altered mental status. But up to a third of cases are asymptomatic or only have these mild symptoms. Plus, studies suggest that our sensitivity for SVP, just based on our assessment, is anywhere between 40 to 75%. But let's get to those features. Abdominal pain or tenderness is the most sensitive finding for SBP, over 90%. It's also the most common finding, but it's not specific. 
The pain or tenderness is almost always diffuse, but it can be subtle because of the ascites. Fever, unfortunately, is not sensitive, less than 40%. Also, mild hypothermia is normal in patients with advanced cirrhosis. So think about lowering your threshold for fever to 37.8 degrees Celsius for these patients. Marked hypothermia is specific for SVP, and it's a poor prognostic finding. About half of these patients will have some form of altered mental status. But just like the abdominal pain, it can be subtle. If there's a close contact available, someone who knows them well, like a family member, maybe a roommate, talk to them about any observed changes. There are other signs and symptoms. Nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, even GI bleeding and acute kidney injury. The major takeaway is that you need to think about SVP in any patient who comes into the ED and they have ascites. So it certainly sounds like it's not always a classic clinical picture. Given this fact, how do we actually confirm the diagnosis and what kind of testing do I need to do in the emergency department? The key is a paracentesis for the acidic fluid. The sooner you perform the procedure, the better. One study found that each hour of delay in obtaining that fluid was associated with a 3.3% increase in mortality. Once you have the fluid, send it for cell count and differential, culture, sensitivity, and then also protein. An acidic absolute neutrophil count over 250 is diagnostic for SBP. If you can, inoculate the acidic fluid into blood culture bottles as well, at least 10 milliliters per bottle. That increases the sensitivity to over 90% for cultures. Not all patients need dedicated imaging like a CT scan, but if they have localized tenderness, they're critically ill, or if they have severe pain, then you can get the CT. Now, a lot of these patients are going to have an abnormal PT or thrombocytopenia. There's often trepidation to proceed with a paracentesis due to these lab abnormalities. Do patients need blood product transfusion prior to paracentesis? Yeah, I understand that hesitation. Over 70% of these patients have an elevated INR or thrombocytopenia, but they tend to develop this balanced coagulopathy. And overall, paracentesis is a safe procedure. There's less than a 2% rate of complications that need intervention. And studies have not found an association between an elevated INR or thrombocytopenia with procedural complications. The current guidelines actually don't recommend routinely checking the PT or platelets prior to paracentesis. And they also recommend against the routine prophylactic administration of coagulation factors or platelets. There is one test I like to do before the paracentesis, and that's a bedside ultrasound. This will help you determine the best site, where the best pocket is. You can also look for any vessels running through the abdominal wall, and you can measure the wall thickness. One question that often gets asked is, when should albumin be administered after performing a paracentesis in the emergency department? I'm going to make this simple. If they have SBP, give albumin. IV albumin decreases renal impairments and mortality. There's a number needed to treat of 5 for reducing renal impairment and a number needed to treat of 6 for a reduction in the risk of mortality. The dose is 1.5 grams per kilogram IV once you have the diagnosis. Now, if you've excluded SBP based on the paracentesis, albumin is still warranted if the patient is going to have over 5 liters removed. That's to reduce the risk of post-paracentesis circulatory dysfunction. Yeah, and I'd also remind our colleagues to avoid removing over 6 to 8 liters, or else that will also actually increase the risk of post-paracentesis circulatory dysfunction. Now, the last question that I have for you is, once I've made the diagnosis of SBP, what are the antibiotics that should be administered? Of course, you're going to want to take a look at the local antibiogram first, 
But in most areas, the first-line antibiotic therapy is going to be a third-generation cephalosporin, something like ceftriaxone or cefotaxime. The problem is that 20 to 50% of cases are now due to multidrug-resistant organisms. So that means that if you have a patient who is critically ill, they have end organ injury, they've had a recent hospitalization where they received antibiotics, or if they have recurrent SBP, then you need to expand your coverage with something like piperacillin tazobactam or a carbapenem. Also, if they have a previous history or even significant risk factors for MRSA, then give vancomycin or linazolid. All right, so that was some amazing points. I'm going to just wrap this up for the listeners. So first of all, SVP should be suspected in those with known cirrhosis and ascites presenting with abdominal pain, fever, or altered mental status. The diagnosis requires a paracentesis. This should be performed for any patient with ascites and concern for SVP, upper GI bleeding, or in those being admitted for a complication of their cirrhosis. Paracentesis demonstrating an ANC greater than 250 is diagnostic. All SBP patients should receive IV albumin. Patients don't require routine transfusion to correct coagulation panel or platelet abnormalities prior to paracentesis. And finally, first-line antibiotics include a third-generation cephalosporin, though of course local antibiograms should guide management. Also, be advised that patients may require coverage for multidrug-resistant organisms. Now that's all for today. Thank you so much for your time, Britt, and I look forward to working with you on another one of these episodes soon. Always a pleasure, Hans. There's quite a bit of burnout in emergency medicine, and some of us are looking to trim back our shifts just a little bit and supplement our income with a side gig. Here's Dr. Matt Pointer with the most lucrative side gig. Everyone seems to be looking for a side project these days, something you can do outside of your normal work that doesn't take a lot of time but will generate a little extra money. What if I told you there was a skill you could learn outside of medicine that wouldn't just earn a little money, but would likely pay better than medicine does on a per hour basis? It's not hard to learn, won't take up much time, and it doesn't matter how many other people are doing it, the opportunity will still be there. I'm talking about managing your own investments. Now if that idea scares you, consider this. If you invest $100,000 for 25 years at a 6% rate of return, by the end you would have $430,000. Now if someone else does the investing for you, you might be paying about 2% per year in advisor and mutual fund fees. So how much do you think that 2% per year would lower your investment returns over that 25 years? 2%? 10%? 20%? If you have a hard time with this question, don't feel bad. Everyone does. Humans, even smart ones like doctors, are linear thinkers, and this is the kind of math that involves exponents. The answer is 55%. Over 25 years, paying 2% per year means you would lose $170,000 forever due to those fees, almost twice as much as the original investment. To most people, 2% doesn't sound like much, but due to compounding, you don't just lose 2% of your portfolio every year, you also lose the money that that 2% would have made. It all adds up to the often shocking conclusion that the real cost of annual fees over your lifetime as a physician can be measured in hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars. Now, managing your own investments is not for everyone, but you should at least understand the real cost of paying someone else to do it. My guess is that you work hard for your money and you probably want to keep as much of it as you can. But you might be thinking, wait a second, Matt. It's not like those annual fees are just wasted money. I'm getting access to expert advice and professional portfolio management, right? Well, yes and no. If you're getting quality comprehensive financial planning, that means tax planning, retirement planning, great advice around things like debt management and real estate purchases, there is definitely value in all of that. But if you think paying 1% to 2% per year is getting you better investment returns, well, think again. This might sound counterintuitive, but when it comes to investing, the evidence is clear. High fees are not associated with better returns. In fact, once those fees are taken into account, the opposite is true. High fees equal worse overall returns. There are a lot of reasons for this, but let's cut straight to the evidence. You can Google this right now. SPIVA. S-P-I-V-A. 
That stands for Standard & Poor's Index Versus Active. SPIVA is a group that compares the performance of actively managed investment funds, the ones you would pay a higher fee for, to that of the index or the stock market as a whole. And this is a very relevant comparison because you as an investor have that same choice, high fee active investing, usually in mutual funds, or low fee passive investing in something called an index fund. If you're not familiar with what an index fund is, I'll explain it in a second. But what the SPIVA group shows year after year is that even though they have billions of dollars in assets, the sharpest minds in the business, and all the resources anyone could hope for, the vast majority of actively managed mutual funds actually have worse performance than a simple, boring index fund that anyone with a computer can buy themselves. Professional managers simply can't overcome the effect of fees. Of course, there are always a few who do, but the SPIVA reports have shown that this is almost always due to luck and is not sustainable. So if professional investment management isn't worth the cost, is do-it-yourself investing really a viable alternative? What's involved in taking the DIY path anyway? Well, I suppose the bad news is that, yes, there's a learning process. But the good news is that it's not nearly as complicated as you might think. Being a successful DIY investor has nothing to do with analyzing companies or anticipating economic cycles. The key to success is simply following a handful of really basic principles. In fact, the hardest part for a lot of people is doing less, not more. At first, everyone's afraid of making mistakes, but doing less, not more, also happens to be the key to managing risk. And this is easy with those index funds I was just talking about, or more specifically, index ETFs, or exchange traded funds. An index ETF is a fund that anyone can buy through an online investment platform as easily as a single stock. But by buying an index ETF, you're actually buying an entire stock market index, hundreds or even thousands of companies. Not only does it make investing simple, but as the SPIVA group has shown, in the long term, it also means you're almost certain to beat the pros because fees on most index ETFs are usually one-tenth or even one-twentieth those of mutual funds. In a lot of ways, a simple investment plan is less risky because most decisions are automated and you can easily understand what you're doing. So DIY investing is cheaper, it's simpler, and when done properly, low risk. But is it time-consuming? Are DIY investors committing themselves to weekly or even daily portfolio checks and days and days of year-end maintenance and rebalancing? Well, absolutely not. There was actually an interesting study done by Fidelity a couple of years ago. It showed that the best performing accounts of all of their clients belong to a surprising cohort of investors, the ones who had died. It's true. This and many other studies have proven that the less you pay attention to your investments, the better. And this is great news for us. The time involved in being a successful DIY investor is mostly spent learning, not doing. It's just like in medicine, learning how to suture took some time. But once you know how, doing the suturing is relatively quick and easy. I would estimate it takes about 25 hours to learn the basics of DIY investing. One or two books and some supplementary online learning. You might also hire a flat fee financial planner to get you up and running with the benefit of some expert advice. There are many paths to take. Of course, there's lots more beyond the basics, but that 25 hours could easily save you $500,000 in fees over your lifetime, likely a lot more. So do the math. $500,000 divided by 25 hours, that's $20,000 an hour. Learning how to do your own investing is the most lucrative side gig, hands down. Nothing even comes close. Do DIY investors make mistakes? Of course they do, but don't let this stop you. You don't have to jump in all at once. Start with one small account. Even if you learn about investing and then decide not to do it yourself, it'll still make the conversations you have with your financial advisor far more productive, and you'll be a lot less likely to be taken advantage of. The payoff is virtually guaranteed. In my experience, the biggest regret of DIY investors by far is not starting earlier. So if you care about your financial future, and I bet you do, consider learning about DIY investing as one of your side projects. Before we get into the quick review of the quick hits, the online international EM Cases Summit tickets go on sale July 16th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
It's the best online EM conference in the world, and it features your favorite EM Cases guest experts. On November 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, you'll be immersed in the most interactive and engaging, rejuvenating, and mind-blowing educational experience. We've got a rural EM symposium and an ED flow symposium, virtual simulations with Sarah Fui, and procedural goodies, case-based discussions, and you can ask any of the speakers questions and get answers in real time. It's also way less expensive than most other conferences. Tickets are at emcasesummit.com starting July 16th at 10 a.m. Get them while they last. Now the EM Quick Hits Review. In part one of HIV, recognition and testing, Dr. Landis talked about how we need to order HIV tests in patients who present with a flu-like illness and have one risk factor, because the sooner they're started on treatment, the better their outcomes, and because testing can prevent the spread of disease. For patients who present with a fever, and for all patients who present with fever, in addition to asking them about immunization status and recent travel, Ask about the big HIV risk factors like IV drug use. You're saving your patient's life and doing a public health service at the same time. Then there was Jesse McLaren on STEMI versus occlusion MI or OMI criteria. We are missing the opportunity to save lives with emergency cath lab activation or thrombolysis in patients who do not fulfill STEMI criteria but do have an occlusion MI, like those who only have isolated significant ST depression in the anterior leads, that's enough to say posterior MI, activate the cath lab. Or those with de Winter waves, just a couple examples. Review the ECG cases blogs on STEMI versus OMI and POCUS in OMI and go through the examples to solidify what needs a cath lab activation or thrombolysis. Or even better, sign up for a HEARTS ECG course. Swami reminded us that we should not use a GCS of 8 or a gag reflex alone as indications for endotracheal intubation. The decision to intubate is a nuanced one, and recent evidence shows that patients who are intoxicated and get intubated have a significantly higher rate of complications compared to those who don't. In our Just the Facts CGEM series, we were reminded to think about spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in every patient with ascites and belly pain especially if that belly pain is diffuse and unexplained. Tap the belly, even if the INR is up or the platelets are down, and start antibiotics early. And last but not least, if you have any interest in investing, think about learning how to do it, and it could become an enjoyable and lucrative side gig. The next main episode is going to be on pediatric meningitis, which can be very tricky to pick up and has some recent evidence to help guide us. So until next time... Take it easy.